Hello, this is Miss Moore, and today during chemistry, we're going to discuss mass spectrometry. Today's essential question, how is a mass spectrum used to determine average atomic mass? Here we go, mass spectrometer. So mass spectrometry is a technique that separates particles according to their masses. That's important. Okay, so they, the, the particles, a whole group of particles end up being separated according to how much they weigh, their masses. So in general, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how this works. So a mass spectrometer uses an ionizing beam of electrons to analyze the sample of an element or a compound by turning these atoms or compounds into positive ions. So basically what happens here, this ionizing beam of electrons, so electrons are shot to or against the atoms or compounds, and that knocks off an electron off the atom. Let's just stick with an atom for now, making the atom a positive ion, okay? And then um, these now ions are, are accelerated through a tube, and there's a magnet, and this magnet helps to separate the positive ions by its mass. The ions then hit a detection, detection plate, which records how many ions hit at a particular location. And that location is the locations on the, the te detection plate are mapped out. And that allows us to determine its mass. And then the last step is the result, a bar graph of masses to relative abundance is then generated which we can analyze. Okay, so now the part that we really care about is how do we decode a mass spectrum? Um, so here are two different bar graphs. The mass spectrum is usually plotted out um, either as percent abundance here, which, is, which one's a little bit easier, or by relative intensity. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to read both these types of graphs and how can we use that to determine average atomic mass of um, either an atom or a compound. All right, and we are going to start by discussing the graph that gives us percent abundance. So relative abundance or percent abundance. Um, this type of graph shows the relative number of atoms of each isotope. The numbers have been normalized to 100, so when you read the graph, you're going to read it as if it's out of a total of 100 atoms. So if we look at the graph, what we would say with something that says percent abundance here, or it could also say relative abundance, what we're trying to say is that if we had 100 atoms, 79 of them, or 79%, um, have a mass of 24, 10 of them have a mass of 25, and 11 of them have a mass of 26. All right, so to calculate what we really want to do with these graphs, um, the, mass spec the mass spectrum, is we want to calculate the average atomic mass. And what you do is you look at the graph, and then you use the equation average atomic mass equals the sum of the mass of each isotope times the abundance of each isotope, divide that by 100. And that will give us the average atomic mass of the um, atom in this case, or the, the element. Okay, let's try to figure out the average atomic mass of this particular element. What we know about this element from looking at the mass spectrum is that this element has three isotopes um, with three different masses, 24, 25, and 26. And we know the relative abundance of each of those. So we just need to plug that into our average atomic mass formula. So remember, average atomic mass equals the sum of the mass of each isotope times the abundance of each isotope divided by 
100. So we're going to have um, our isotope with a mass of 24, which has an abundance of 79%, and our isotope with a mass of 25, which has an abundance of 10%. And our isotope with a mass of 26, which has an abundance of 11% divided by 100. And when I calculate all of that out, I come up with 24. 32. So the mass of this particular element is 24.32 AMU and that turns out to be magnesium. Um, because I highly doubt that these are actual perfect masses. I ended up not using sig figs here and I just rounded to two decimal places. Um, so there you go. That's how you figure out the average atomic mass when you have a mass spectrum that is in percent abundance or relative abundance. Pretty easy. All right. The next way the mass spectrum can be presented is in terms of relative intensity. So let's talk about how you would decode this type of mass spectrum. All right, relative intensity mass spectrum. So um, relative intensity mass spectrum also shows the relative number of atoms of each isotope type. Um, however, here's where the difference comes in. The isotope that hits the detectors most often is set at 100%, and the height of the other peaks are the number of isotopes relative to the 100%. So before you can calculate the average atomic mass, the total intensity must be normalized um, so that now Together, they all the total intensity is going to equal 100% as opposed to the isotope with the most hits equaling 100%. So how do you do that? You divide the value of each intensity peak by the total intensity and multiply that by 100 to get the normal, normalized relative abundance. Um, it's not much different than the relative isotope mass spectrum. It's just another step. Okay, let's try to figure out the average atomic mass of this element using the relative intensity mass spectra. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the total intensity. So the relevant, relative intensity of the isotope with a mass of 24 is the largest. It's going to be 100%. The relative, relative intensity of the isotope with a mass of 25 is 13, and the relative intensity of the isotope with a mass of 26 is 14. So the total intensity is 127. So we're now going to divide each of the um, relative intensities by the total intensity to get the relative abundance. So relative abundance equals 100 divided by 127 times 100. And that gives me 78.74. Um, again, I don't really know what the, um, what the sig figs are, so I'm just going to round to two decimal places. Um, 
the relative abundance of the, oh, this is, this is for the isotope that's mass of 24. The isotope that's mass of 25, we're going to take 13 divided by the total abundance, which is 127. Multiply that by 100, and that gives us 10.24. And the relative abundance of the isotope that has a mass of 26 is going to be the relative intensity 14 divided by the total intensity 127 times 100, giving us, let's see, 11.02. Okay. Now we have our relative intensities, or our relative abundance, and we can figure out the average atomic mass using again the sum of the mass of the isotope multiplied by the abundance of the isotope. So we're going to have for the isotope that has a mass of 24, it'll be 78.74 plus the mass of isotope 25 times its abundance plus the isotope with a mass of 26 times its abundance. Divide that by 100, giving us an average atomic mass of 24.32. Same answer. Um, so that is how you calculate average atomic mass using a mass spectrum with relative intensity. Okay, last thing we're going to learn today is determining the number of spectrum peaks in a compound. So if you were given a compound, um, could you go back and predict how many peaks there were going to be? Um, and this goes with isotope data as well. So let's see how this would work. So a compound can also be analyzed through a mass spectrometer. Um, and if you know the isotopes of each atom in a compound, the number of peaks that should be found in the mass spectrum can be predicted. So the way you do this is you combine the isotopes of each atom in the compound in every possible way, determine the mass of each compound made, um, each compound meaning any combination of the, of the isotopes. I'll, sh I'll do a practice problem in a minute. It'll make more sense. And then you count the number of different mass possible masses to determine the number of mass spectrum peaks. Pretty easy, can be slightly cumbersome, but fairly easy. Okay, um, so let's try this. How would you determine the number of spectron peaks in a compound? So here's our practice problem. Carbon and hydrogen both have two stable isotopes. Carbon can be carbon 12, meaning carbon with a mass of 12, and carbon 13. And hydrogen can have hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 2. How many peaks would you observe in the mass spectrum of the positive ion of CH2 plus. Remember when you shoot something through a mass spectrum, you turn it into an ion by knocking off an electron, okay? All right, so um, doing this is, is kind of weird. It's really not that difficult, but you gotta kind of think it through. So we have CH2, right? That's what we're looking at, CH2. Um, each C can be either carbon 12 or carbon 13. And then we have two H's. And those two H's can be either come from H1 or H2, which means this could be H11 or it could be both of them could be the 2H, or you could have it combined as H with a mass of 1 and H of a mass of 2. 
So it's kind of easy to, it's easier, in my opinion, to set up a chart of all the possibilities. Um, so let's do that. Let me erase this mess first. All right, so I'm gonna make a chart here. Um, our two possibilities for carbon are carbon 12 or carbon 13. Um, our H's, because remember it's CH2, so our poss possibilities for H2 are two H's each with a mass of one, or two H's each with a mass of two, or two H's, one with a mass of one, one with a mass of two. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in the table with all the possible masses depending on um, which, which, what connects with what. So if our carbon 12 were to hook up with these two H's, we would have a mass. We have a carbon 12, so that's 12, plus the two H's each, which have a mass of 1, which gives us a mass of 14. If the carbon 12 instead were to hook up with those two H's, it'd be carbon 12 plus H2 plus H2, which would give us a mass of 16. Um, and if the carbon 12 were to hook up with those two H's, we would have a mass of 12 for carbon 12 plus a mass of 1 for the H1 and a mass of 2 for the H2, giving us a mass of 15. All right, and if we do it for the other side, um, if that carbon 3, if the, sorry, carbon 13 were to hook up with the um, two H1s, we would have a mass of 15. If um, the carbon 13 were to hook up with the H's, the two H2s, we would have a mass of 17. And if the carbon 13 were to hook up with a mass of, with a hydrogen one and hydrogen two, you would end up with a mass of 16. Um, these masses in the center here, uh, I guess I'll use this. These masses in the center here are all the possible masses for CH2, depending on which car carbon isotope and which hydrogen isotopes are involved in making the CH2. And in any sample of CH2, you are going to end up with all of these possibilities. So when you run it through a spe mass spectrometer, you're going to get a certain number of peaks. But remember, the mass spectrometer is based on separating things by mass. So what we need to do is look at all of the um, different types of masses. Let me get rid of some of this stuff here. So let's go through this. We have a mass of 14, a mass of 15, 16, and 17. Then down here we have another mass of 15. And even though this original mass of 15 was made up of carbon 13 and two hydrogen ones and this 15 down here is made up of carbon 12 and a hydrogen one and a hydrogen two the mass spectrometer can't tell the difference so this one is not going to make its own peak it's going to be added in to the carbon 13 h1 h1 peak um, and then the same for the 16. so how many peaks would this mass spectrum have it would have four peaks and if we were to sketch it out, goodness, I'm horrible at this part. So down here we have a mass and we have, let's see, what do we have here? 14, 15, 16, 17. You would end up with four peaks. Um, from this, I don't know the relative abundances, uh, but so it looks something like that. All right, that's it for today. Have a good one.